but we're gonna open this meeting in the memory of Madeline Barber. She passed away yesterday suddenly, um, and we're still in shock, but we will open and close in her memory. So we're gonna start with the flag salute. I'm gonna turn it over to Nick. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's LGBTQ plus Pride Month, so happy Pride Month, everybody. Um, um, we're honored to have a great youth leader with us tonight to lead the pledge, um, not just for the LGBTQ plus community, but for Altadena as a whole. Ella Yuri has, is a 2022 graduate of John Muir High School. Ella is, yay, Muir. Ella is the founder, co-president, and social media manager of John Muir LGBTQ plus Alliance and has worked tirelessly to help empower fellow LGBTQ plus students, find their voice and really just feel proud of who they are. Ella's achievements are plenty, a Posse Scholar, a Queer Sanctuary founding member, a teaching artist and executive board member for the Art Hour nonprofit. Ella will be attending Bucknell University in the fall majoring in education. Ella plans to become an eth ethnic studies teacher as well as a strong advocate and state level policymaker for public education. Best of all, this brilliant and focused Altadena resident plans to return to us with designs to be a teacher back at John Muir High School. We're lucky to have this incredible Altadena leading our pledge tonight. Thank you, Ella. Please rise. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. Thank you for that, Ella. We're gonna move on to roll call. Dorothy Wong. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, let's get a roll call. Uh, Victoria Knapp. Present. Amy Lyford. Present. Hannah Petrie. Present. Dorothy Wong, present. Uh, Daryl Aranda. Present. Thank you, Veronica Jones. Present. Thank you, Nick Arnzen. Present. Uh, thank you, Billy Malone. Present. Hello. Uh, Doug Cauliflower. <laughs> I am here. Hi, nice to see you. See you. Uh, Reginald Wilkins. I think I'm here. Thank you. Um, Chris O'Malley. Excused. Uh, Dr. Sandra Thomas. Excused. Alan Peck. Excused. Sylvia Vega. Sylvia Vega. Excused. Thank you. And Diane, Diane Markison. Excused. So we have a quorum. We do. Okay, we're gonna move on to the approval of our June 21st, 2022 agenda. Victoria Knapp. Good evening, fellow council members. The Altadena Town Council Executive Committee met on Tuesday, June 14th to set the agenda for tonight's meeting, and the agenda was circulated to you on Saturday, June 18th. I've received no changes. Are there any changes? Seeing none, I motion that the agenda be approved as presented. Agenda approved as presented. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. <laughs> All those opposed? The agenda has moved forward as presented. Okay, we're going to move on to the chairman's report. Um, tonight is our first night back after almost two and a half years. Um, we're not on Zoom, and I don't have my pajama bottoms on, so <laughs> I'm okay. Um, but it's... Um, it's hard because we lost Madeline. It's been really hard to understand um, why she, or how come she had to leave so suddenly and we had no indication that anything was wrong. Um, 
Madeline was the type of person that you wanted on your team. She was a hard worker, she believed in the council, and she really wanted to do good for the community. She will be missed. Um, it's hard, it, it's just really hard to think that someone 55 years old goes to sleep and do doesn't get up. So um, we just, um, we know we have to move forward, but we will never forget her and we're here for her family. So I just want to end with that, that um, I already miss her and I want us tonight to just maybe think of when we had interaction with her and how she reacted to any of us. It was always with warmth and kindness. So that's my report. We'll have the vice chair's report, Victoria Knapp. Good evening, community. Sure. I'm sorry. We were going to do it now, so just give me just a second. Um, given the profound loss that her death has had on the council, I'm going to yield my time. But I thought it was important that Madeline never had a chance to have an in-person meeting with us. So we have kept a seat for her and her name placard here so that she's here with us in spirit. And so I would ask that everyone think of her, think of her husband, her son, and her grandson, and observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, we, we move on to our recording secretary, Nick Arnson. Thank you, Chair. May 17th, Altadena Town Council meeting minutes were sent to the full council last week. I received notes and made appropriate changes. We sent out the final document this weekend. Do my fellow council members have any further additions or corrections? Seeing none, with no further changes, I move we accept the May 17th, 2022 Altadena Town Council minutes as is. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Minutes carry forward as presented. Next, we have our treasurer's report. And um, Chris O'Malley isn't here, but he sent his report. He said the council began the period from April 28th to May 26th with a balance of $1,857.19. <laughs> there were two withdrawals made, one for $13.99 for GoDaddy and one for $31.73 for checks. The ending balance was $1,811.47. That's the treasurer's report. Okay, we move on to Dorothy Wong, our corresponding secretary. Uh, thank you, Chair Jones. Uh, so I was trying to get on the internet, so sorry about that, because uh, we did receive one correspondence uh, regarding PFOWL and asking for the town council uh, to look at uh, actions we might take um, coming up, so I'll share that letter with everybody for consideration. And then uh, anything going on, we have lots of uh, activities going on in July. You'll hear a lot about them during this meeting. Uh, and also a special shout out to July 2nd, uh, the Mariposa Junction uh, will be also um, expanded to an open street event. Uh, so that's in process, along with the other great stuff happening. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Council Member Wong. Okay, we're gonna move on to our public safety reports. Um, Council Member Chair, before we move on, I just want sure. to mention one thing is we usually at live meetings hand around a can for yeah. donations. I don't know if we have that today. Oh, the, um, we do have the can in the back. I'll go get it, we'll, we'll do it yeah. afterwards. And, and, and if, if we do that, may I suggest that anything that's given tonight goes towards Madeline's family oh, or to sure. purchase something for the memorial. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes, I forgot. We haven't been here passing around the can. We pass our can around. Okay. And um, as Council Member Malone said, all the money will go to the family and we will add to it and find out whatever else they may need. Okay. We're going to start with our California Highway Patrol, Officer Jeremy Keller and Brian Bay.
Uh, good evening, council members. Good evening, members of the public. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. I'm Officer Bay with the California Highway Patrol over at uh, Altadena off of uh, Windsor Avenue. Um, just want to give a report for the month of May for traffic collisions. Uh, we had 14 total traffic collisions within the unincorporated area. Uh, one is a vehicle versus pedestrian. There were six injury traffic collisions, as well as one hit and run, uh, no bicyclists uh, related coll collisions, and two collisions uh, that resulted in a, a DUI or an investigation for driving under the influence um, out of those 14 collisions. Uh, as for events that the Highway Patrol was a part of for the month of May, uh, we had two uh, what we call special enforcement units um, and, and enforcement days. We call them SEUs. One was for commercial vehicles primarily, as well as a uh, seatbelt and safety uh, commercial day or um, enforcement day. So that was uh, very successful. Uh, I don't have the exact statistics regarding that, but I know that the commercial uh, enforcement day was encompassing the whole entire I-210 corridor. We partnered with other highway patrol agencies or area offices, and I think we issued a, close to 500 um, citations for moving violations. So we're out there, we're very proactive, and uh, we understand that we all use these freeways and that it's a major artery for our commerce. But with that being said, we, we utilize that for our transportation and our um, child and getting our kids to schools as well. So uh, that, and I also want to say that the Highway Patrol is hiring. We're trying to get the 1,000 new um, members to join our, our, our agency. So if anyone knows of anyone that's interested, please do not hesitate to contact me or myself or Officer Boyd. And um, we can give you more information regarding that, as well as we have our Explorer and Senior Volunteer Program to help out the community as well. Uh, that concludes my time. Are there any questions regarding the council members? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the Explorer program. Could you tell me the age on that? Yes, sir. So the age group is from 15 years old to, I believe, 20 years old, and that uh, includes, um, you know, prospective uh, applicants that are interested in life in the Highway Patrol or maybe in, you know, public service. Uh, duties include, you know, going, you know, uh, you know, drill and understanding vehicle violations as well as what we do during traffic collisions, DUI checkpoints and just other uh, ride-alongs, other kind of activities as well. And is this a summer program or an ongoing program? It's ongoing, okay. yeah, annual, year-round, yes. And then uh, the, my last question was, you mentioned that you are looking to hire more people. Is that specifically officer or administration or what levels is that? So, yeah, great, great point. So we do want to hire more officers, but we do have a lot of non-uniform uh, positions as well that, that are being offered. So if you're a maintenance technician, maintenance um, personnel, um, also, we have dispatchers. We are in a, we have bio, uh, really good need of, of dispatchers to help take these calls and, and, and help us out as well. So it's open to a lot, but there's a big push for, for people on, on the roadways. Thank you. And we can put a link on our website if you have one as well. Okay. Our website. Are those, are those positions mostly here? Um, so it's statewide. I'll, I'll say that, that it's statewide, but a lot of the new applicants and, uh, that pass our academy, they do come to the high metropolitan area. Okay. So that, that'll be, Altadena is kind of one of those areas, but as well as the Golden Gate area, the Bay Area, and okay. down the border. Okay. Okay, any more questions? No questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have our Altadena Sheriff Station, Captain Williams. Oh, yeah, I like the map. If you do, you want to wipe it off, or are you come? We I'm have fine. wipes. I'm fine. Okay. I trust. <laughs> um, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, great to be here in person. I was just uh, mentioning to someone the last time I was actually in this room, I believe I was being interviewed for the position. So. Yep. Yeah. I, I did. I did. <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to start off with my condolences to uh, Madeline Barber and her family. Um, 
also my condolences to the uh, town council. Uh, she will be missed. So. Yes, uh, just a few stats. Uh, our aggravated assaults are down 2%, and those are the violent crimes. And most of those are from domestic violence issues or uh, some uh, assaults that we have or we see in the group homes. So uh, not much going on in the streets. We had a few incidents. I'll talk about one in a bit. Uh, and our property crimes, that's still a problem, but they're actually down 4% compared to what they were last year around this time. And again, the main problems are burglary thefts and catalytic converter thefts. So we, we did have a, two incidents I want to talk about. We had an uh, in-custody death where we had someone in our custody was being detained on a, a traffic stop. Uh, at some point, we don't know when, he ingested uh, some narcotics and uh, he went into distress. He made it to the hospital and he, and he passed away. Uh, we were thinking it was fentanyl and uh, we treated it as such. Uh, the public uh, health or um, hazmat came out from the fire department. They tested it the next day. It was not fentanyl. It was uh, just cocaine. So we're trying to figure out uh, how much he actually ingested. We'll find out later, but that's still being investigated by our homicide uh, unit. Uh, nothing that we did. We didn't use any force or anything like that on the person. It's just during the traffic stop, he went under distress and then um, come to find out he ingested narcotics. We did have another uh, incident. It was a shooting on Harriet. This is about a couple of weeks ago. A uh, gentleman was in front of the house. Somebody drove by. Some words were exchanged. Uh, one person didn't agree, and the guy in the car uh, let off two shots and hit the person. He was transported to the hospital, and uh, he recovered. Matter of fact, I believe he's been discharged. And the areas where he was shot, he's really fortunate because it's surprising that he didn't pass away from the areas that he was shot on his body. Uh, our detectives are handling that investigation and uh, it's ongoing. We do have a few events uh, coming up. Again, I was talking about the catalytic converter thefts. That's been an issue nationwide. So uh, we've been trying to put on these catalytic converter events. Uh, we had one last week, I'm sorry, the week, yeah, last week. Uh, it went off without a hitch. We have some uh, innovative equipment where we can easily etch a vehicle or etch a uh, catalytic converter pretty quickly. Um, so we got that, we got our ramps, we had it here at the station. We didn't set up for appointments, we just said come, come one, come all. And we were able to etch around 60, 65 vehicles in a four to five hour period, which is actually not that bad. So, being that we have this equipment on loan to us for a while, we're gonna use it as often as we can. So we're hoping to have another event in the next month or so. Uh, and if we do, we'll just put it out on social media. We didn't have it on a Saturday, we normally have it on Saturdays. This time we had it on a Friday. Uh, the next time we're gonna change up the days just to see what's best for, uh, for everyone. And hopefully you guys can come out and get your catalytic converter etched. And that's a great way of us um, investigating. If we catch somebody with catalytic converters, we can attach it to a victim and we can prosecute that person for the crime. We catch a lot of people all the time with catalytic converters in the backseat of their cars and their trunks. And we don't, we don't know who it belongs to. And uh, we can hold them for a couple of days. And after that, they're gone. If the DA won't have a victim, they won't prosecute. So this is a great way for us to uh, attach that property to a victim, and it helps with uh, trying to prosecute the people that are doing the, these crimes. We actually caught a few people uh, maybe about a month ago, maybe less than that, with a whole bunch of catalytic converters. And, uh, and of course, we, we did the best we could. We were looking for victims, and we couldn't find any. We had to let them go, but at least we have them in our database, and we're keeping an eye on, on them. So another event coming up is uh, August 2nd, and I'll talk more about this next month. We're having our national night out. It's gonna be at Farnsworth Park uh, between, I, I wanna double check the hours, but I wanna say three to seven. It could be five to seven, I'll double check. We are trying to get some things in order before we send the flyer out, but just remember, mark your calendars, April, August 2nd. Uh, 
National Night Out event at Farnsworth Park. And you can come out, enjoy your, your, your time there. It'll be some uh, food and games and all of that. And everything should be free, at least on the Sheriff's Department's part. So, uh, Other than that, that's, that's all I have to present, unless there's any questions for me. Are there any questions? Council Member Aranda. So my catalytic converter was stolen mm -hmm. a couple days after a etch and sketch etching, and then it was stolen again, the new one was stolen again, while I was on vacation about a week before the next event. It, it was etched too? Nope. Oh. And it, between etchings, I got stolen twice. Oh, okay. So um, the first time I was parked in the church parking lot, and the second time it was in front of my house here at Jackson Elementary. So um, if you find, if you found any Honda Element, <laughs> um, uh, Catalytics. All right. I'll say it's fine. Okay, because you it's got definitely. It. <laughs> I'm, I've registered both of them with my insurance company. Okay. Um, I went ahead and purchased a uh, cat cat protector. Great. Um, because just to deal with having it returned and everything is just not worth it. Uh, just to explain, you know, the catalytic converter we do etch. It does not stop the person from. Uh, taking the catalytic converter. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes if they can see it's etched, maybe they're determined they'll move on to uh, the path least resistant. But uh, the best way, one of the best ways is to get a cage or protector underneath your catalytic converter that stops them from, uh, or hinders them from being able to cut it off. Now, if you haven't seen a video of a catalytic converter being taken, you ought to check it out on YouTube. It's two cuts, zoop, zoop, and it's off in less than a minute. With the cage, We've seen people try to get it off. It takes normally around 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and it's noisy. So that kind of deters people if they see that, that, that cage. Is the, um, the automotive shop that was on Walnut still providing that service? It you know, I don't know. I have to find out. But we okay. did have uh, um, an auto shop that said they would do it. This was Before on our first one. Edge. That was yeah. back in February. So. I'll, I will double check on that. You know. But for our next catalytic converter uh, event, I told the person putting it on, please find someone that uh, uh, will provide that type of service. That way, when you do come, we, at least we can give you a, um, uh, a name of a place that will provide that service. And it's going to cost a couple of hundred bucks, but I understand a catalytic converter, if you, you know, it's covered by insurance. $3,500 without insurance. Okay. Do that twice. <laughs> the main cars that are being targeted are uh, Toyota Priuses. If I'm saying that right, Priuses, Prius, um, or high-rising trucks because they're easy to get under. Was your uh, uh, Honda Element uh, number Element. two? Yeah. Well. Same as Dell. Mm -hmm. the, the first time they actually took off the four nuts, so they must have zip, zip, zip four nuts. So I had the muffler shop weld the nuts on. So then they just cut the pipes further off next time, mm -hmm. which then that destroyed not just the Cadillac, it destroyed everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think the cage is probably the best way to go, I'd mm -hmm. recommend. It is. And there are some people, there are amateurs out there that don't know what a catalytic converter looks like, and they'll just cut anything off the car. So. Any more questions? Okay, thank you, Captain. Thank you, Captain. What was that? Thanks. Oh, we have a question. Oh, yes, it is. Mostly happening at night when people are asleep, uh, two in the mornings, mostly. And we, we pinpoint an oh, yeah. area where it's happening the most, and we're trying to do more patrol checks in that area. Uh, we'll continue that. But um, again, it's um, you know, crime of opportunity, and it's a matter of uh, try, trying to catch them in the act or after it happened. Do you recommend that we keep our light on? Yeah, there are a few things I recommend. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, parking it in your driveway, that's a good recommendation. Under lights, try to keep it in the garage if you can. If you have uh, a lot of stuff in your garage and you can clear it out, I recommend doing that so you can put your car in that garage. Um, and uh, try not to park it so far away from your house. Neighborhood watch, if you tell your neighbors about the same thing, if they see anything crazy or out of uh, place, suspicious, please contact the um, uh, sheriff's Department right away. I must say, I was parked in front of my house underneath the street light, 
And when they stole it the first time, I was parked in the church parking lot underneath that street light. That was the devil. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they move real fast. I don't know if you guys have those tools. I do. And it's very fast. Okay, thank you, Captain. Thanks for having me. All right, can you take that basket out in the audience and? This is this is for Madeline Barber's shaker yeah. family. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Okay, um, is Marie Grecken here from Fire? She is not, but I'm here. Oh, okay, we'll have you. Come on. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Whoa. Hello, my name's Theodore Svoboda. I'm one of the battalion chiefs in La Cunada Flint Ridge at Fire Station 82. There's three of us. I'm on the A shift, which is on today. Maria Greiken is our community service liaison, and she's on vacation. So she asked if I would come and present yeah. our run statistics for the month of May. So I have those for you. So month of May, was a slow month. It's about to get busier, as you can imagine, with the dryness of the brush and the threat of fireworks. So for the month of May, we went on a total of 59 medical calls. So of the 59 medical calls, 48 of those were transported by advanced life support with paramedics on board. And it looks like the majority of them were psychological rescues. Also major injuries, which are probably created from uh, traffic accidents, some trauma there, and a uh, person sick. So my safety tip of the month is all fireworks are illegal, even safe and sane. They all are very dangerous and they start fires. So if you see people with fireworks, ask them to stop and go to a permitted venue I believe the Rose Bowl is a permitted venue for mm -hmm. fireworks. And Crescent, Crescenta Valley High School, I believe, is also a permitted event for uh, July 4th. And with that, I've worked a few 4th of Julys. I've worked many, actually. And fireworks are real. Last July 3rd, I worked. And we had small starts from fireworks up the Crest Highway which we were able to catch early, but had we not got there in a timely fashion, it might have been different. But so just, I can only stress fireworks. Just if you see it, ask them to stop, okay? That's all that I have, and I'm open to questions. I, do have questions. I have. Yes. Can I? My first need, so if I can, go ahead. Go ahead, it's fine, go ahead. Okay. I can't speak specifically about that off the top of my head, but yes, homelessness and homeless encampments are real. They're all over. So. Okay. Anybody else? Dorothy Wong, Council Member Wong. Hi, uh, just quickly, last year you guys had uh, no fireworks signs that we could get? Yes, yes, and we are going to distribute those soon. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Pasadena's already got theirs up. Are you talking about at the fire station? Or where, where are you talking about? We were, uh, they were cardboard, or uh -huh. light cardboard, and we were able to kind of put them up Cheney Trail, for example, and along Wilma Alta. Okay, yeah, we have a fireworks program and reporting so it says here, yeah, no fireworks signs will be distributed. Mm. Oh, I'm trying to see the date here. Starting June 12th, so we're, we're here. So June 12th through July 10th. Okay. Uh, anyways, yes, I'm sure we're a little behind, but yeah. Yeah, we were able to pick them up from the fire station. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Is yes. There a number that we can call because it's not really safe walking up to somebody setting off their own personal firework you know, and saying, please stop. So is there a number that we can call that um, would actually get a response? Call the sheriff. sheriff. The sheriff station. The sheriff station. Captain, uh, will you give the number out, Captain? Yeah. It's uh, 626. 7981131 three, one. or as they said 911 okay thank you okay thank you okay thank you for that information okay we're going to move on to our special presentations and we have two of them and we're going to start with LA Metro Jefferson Rosa, Community Relations Manager. Okay. We're going to just ask, I'm just going to say, I'm going to ask everybody to please stay within your time um, tonight. We want to get out. Thank you. Was that 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Yeah. Is that what you were told? Yes. And then we have questions and answers. Yes. Yeah. Would you let me know? Thank you so okay. much. I appreciate Thank you. it. Oh. Okay. Thank you all so much for having me today. I really appreciate um, and uh, my. Oh. oh. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Oh. Okay. Thank you so much for having me uh, this evening, and uh, my condolences to. Uh, the town council and uh, the Altadena community. So I, I have a presentation for all, all of you today on um, Metro's next gen uh, bus update. And I've also merged it in with our uh, Metro microservice. So if I can start with the first slide, please. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in December of 2020, uh, Metro started the implementation of the next gen bus plan. Uh, these were changes to multiple bus lines around the county to synthesize and try to condense some of the bus lines that were um, less utilized uh, to provide more frequent service in bus lines that were uh, had higher demands. Um, in June of 2021, um, a majority of the next-gen bus plan was implemented in the San Gabriel Valley and the Arroyo Verdugo area. Uh, changes were made to the lines that you see up on the slide. Uh, more relevant to this area, bus lines 687 and a new line 662, which I'll go over in the next slide. Um, the Altadena, Pasadena, and Sierra Madre Metro Microzone was also established. This is our Metro Micro is a microtransit system that is on a three-year pilot program or a three-year pilot timeline. Um, in December of 2021, uh, some more route changes were established with the addition of line 660, which again, I'll go on the next slide. Um, in February of this year, 2022, um, due to an increased shortage of bus operators, uh, there have been a lot of service cancellations. So uh, Metro has actually reduced the number of, um, the number of, uh, or the frequency of those trips in order to make it a little bit more reliable. And I think that slide may be cut off short, so if you can scroll. I think part of the information is cut off. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, service levels were reduced in order to make the bus lines a little bit more predictable on our uh, transit application that Metro is partnering with. And in June of this year, Metro will be, for, for, Metro will be working on restoring uh, service and restoring uh, service reliability, which um, is essentially the accuracy of the timeliness of buses, um, accounting for post-COVID increase in traffic. And you can go on to the next slide, please. So this is what the Metro Micro, this is Metro Micro's uh, or Microtransit 
zone uh, for the Altadena, Pasadena, and Sierra Madre zone looks like in the backdrop of the bus line changes that I mentioned. So in order to um, mitigate for the loss of the bus lines that you see in the dotted black line, so those lines that were discontinued, um, Metro launched Metro Micro, which is a micro transit service. It is a bus that fits up to eight people. Um, it is very similar to uh, rideshare applications such as Lyft and Uber. Um, one thing to point out from this map that you see here is that after community feedback, the zone was extended to reach on the north, where it says uh, Loma Alta, to reach the foothills for folks that would like to take a micro transit service to the trailheads of any um, trails. Uh, and it was also expanded to include the um, Huntington Memorial Hospital on the bottom left, as well as the, I believe it's the Sierra, or apologies, the uh, Arcadia station on the gold line. So if we could go to the next slide, thank you. So a couple of details, I can't quite read up there, so I'm gonna go off my notes, I apologize. So a couple of details that you can see here is a heat map of the usage of the Metro Micro system in the uh, Pasadena, Altadena, Sierra Madre zone. Uh, on the left you see origination, where the trips are starting, and on the right you see the destination of where those trips are ending. Most of those are focused in the Pasadena, area and along the uh, gold line, but definitely Altadena Sierra Madre has a lot of usage. Um, on, uh, on a daily weekday basis, the rides range between 416 to 469 rides per day. Uh, the average trip time that our users are taking is 14 to 15 minutes to get to and from their destinations. And on average, the distances are three to 3.5 miles um, long. So where some folks may have lost service to a bus stop or a bus line, Metro Micro is filling in those gaps for those short trip distances. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Metro, more about Metro Micro. Next slide. Um, so Altadena, Pasadena, uh, Sierra Madre is one of eight zones that you see here countywide where um, next gen um, synthesize certain bus lines. The Altadena, Pasadena, Sierra Madre zone operates seven days a week between 5.30 in the morning to 10 p.m. Um, as you just saw on the previous slide, um, Loma Alta is the northern boundary, the 210 on the west, and Santa Anita on the east. Um, this zone was launched in June of 2021, and it is one of our top three in terms of ridership and usage, so it is very well utilized. Um, the pilot program is running between December of 2020 to December of 2023, uh, at which point the Metro Board will review the pilot program, the results, the usage, um, and the cost of operating the program, and kind of determine from there what the next iteration of the program will be. Next slide, please. And so very quickly, just to go over a refresher for any of you who have not used Metro Micro, it is a very simple um, application. And for those who are not digitally connected, we do have a hotline that can be called. This is the same hotline for anything Metro related. If you have questions about our bus system, our rail system, and now our micro transit system, that number is 323-GO-METRO, 323-466-3876 or you can download the micro app. There's a little icon image there for you all to see what that looks like. It's very similar to other rideshare applications. You choose your location where you're going, um, and then it'll give you a time estimated for a pickup and a time estimated for a drop off to your location. Uh, next slide, please. I would just like to mention that um, there are a couple ways to pay. You can pay with a, with a preloaded tap card in the Metro Micro van. So there's a reader in there. So once it comes to pick you up, you can pay as you board, or you can load a credit card um, to the downloaded application where you can create an account. And that way um, you can just pay off your phone. There is no cash acceptance for the sake of safety. Um, so no cash can be used. Again, um, you can uh, book seats for up to eight riders, and if you, there's anybody um, who needs accessibility um, accommodations, such as a wheelchair um, or a bike, you can definitely note that in the application to make sure that the 
vehicle that picks you up is able to accommodate that. Next slide, please. Uh, that's pretty much, uh, again, going through that. And the cost of Metro Micro is only $1 per trip. Um, it does not give you a transfer to, uh, to transfer for a system. If you go to a Metro uh, bus or rail stop, you will have to then tap in for the 175 for that ride. But it is $1. Um, this was set as an introductory period uh, price. However, there are no, um, no conversations to change this price at this time. For safety and security, all vehicles are equipped with security camera, cameras um, as a level of safety. Uh, and the drivers are Metro employees who do go through a background check. Um, so there are those levels of security and safety. Masks are also um, required at this time because it is an enclosed space. And this is our Metro micro contact information. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Are there any questions? Council Member Knapp? Um, I have two questions. One, what is the, min the minimum age that someone can ride on their own? I believe the minimum age is 13. Okay. And then do you have data on like timeliness? So for instance, if we know that we're going to have a teen that's taking it for the first time, does it tend to run within like within the window of time that they're supposed to be picked up? Yes, so yeah. th I believe the latest average uh, wait time that was re uh, documented was about 18 minutes. And uh, you are able to book rides in advance. So if you know you wanna book a ride for tomorrow at a certain time, I, th I believe you can book a ride up to seven days in advance. And just for the public, I would highly recommend that. There was an, a situation where I needed my son to take Metro Micro home, and he could not get a Metro because he just it was the last day of school. I see. So There's a, a high demand for yeah, sure. Yeah, high demand. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, this area is one of the top three utilized areas, uh, very similar to um, the need for bus drivers system-wide in the county. We are also facing uh, a, a need for um, operators of Metro Micro as well. There. Okay. Wait, we have another question here. Yes. Okay. So um, in looking at the map um, of the Metro Micro areas, the Eagle Rock, Highland Park, Glendale route is actually quite close to the Altadena, Pasadena, Sierra Madre, and I wonder if there's any conversation about making those connect. There hasn't at this time. I know that as we near 2023, the the uh, the project, the program as a whole, will be reevaluated. Uh, there were certain lines that uh, that were cut in that area as well, so that's why that zone was made. Uh, but at this time, there aren't conversations to merge or connect the both. And I would like to know, um, of the eight zones, you can take Metro Micro within each zone, but you cannot take from one zone to another. Mm -hmm. Council Member Malone. Uh, yeah. um, I, I was, uh, I haven't really used it. I think it's a great service. Um, but there was one time when I needed something across the other side of town and I went and I had to drop something off and I, I called Micro Metro, I, I downloaded the app and I said it was going to be 45 minutes before one was going to show up at that location. It was a nice day. I walked home by the time I, you know, halfway across town in 45 minutes. But it made me think about people, you know, maybe the elderly person who, who, or somebody who's going to use the micro metro to go to the store. If they're waiting 45 minutes for it to show up, they go to the store, are they going to have to wait 45 minutes to return? How do you plan a return trip for somebody who is maybe uh, has transit issues? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. That's a, a comment that I can certainly bring back to our operations team. I think one of the biggest issues that the operations team is facing right now is that shortage of operators. Um, we have a, a, a set fleet per zone. It is a, a pilot program that has been funded to a certain extent. So the, the challenge of meeting uh, folks where they're at at the time that's needed uh, is a bit of a challenge. I think scheduling a, a trip in advance would probably be the best option. Um, the, op the operators are definitely trying to make sure that they are as close as possible, as competitive to other rideshare services. Um, it is part of public transit as a means to mitigate the, 
service reduction of bus operations. So I think the best response that I can give you is um, to do a, a scheduling ahead of time, if possible, the day before or a few hours before. Um, if you know uh, someone needs to go to the grocery store at a certain time frame and sort of schedule it, schedule a pickup and schedule a, a return. And on those scheduled times, that would be pretty, like uh, Councilmember Nat was saying, that, was, that would be pretty much within a window if it, you schedule a return trip like that. Correct. It would be a lot easier to find a ride at that particular time if it's scheduled ahead of advance. Yeah. You'd be into the sort of into the program. And I know there's a challenge with everything up here because I've tried ride sharing and everything, and it's okay getting a ride share up here, but trying to book one to go the other direction, it's like there's no cars available. So. It's a challenge. Um, yeah, and you have to wait for them to come up the hill. So it is an issue we face, but hopefully the micro metro is something that can actually fill that gap that we don't even have with regular ride share. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, Council Member Wong. Hi, so I think we uh, got so engaged in this conversation, we've run out of time for our, our next uh, presentation, but can you just give us a quick, what is uh, the active transportation update without the details? Yes, if I can, can give you a quick yeah. announcement, uh, Metro is quick. updating our active transportation strategic plan. This is the plan that outlines where bikeways should be established, uh, safety uh, uh, for pedestrian zones countywide. Metro is currently doing outreach for that. I have provided uh, Dot Wong, our councilwoman here, uh, the details for the next technical um, working group meeting. So if any of you are interested in attending that, um, uh, we can certainly uh, add you to the list to attend. Metro is looking for community input on where biking and walking is important and where there are safety issues so that we can input that in the plan that's being updated. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you all so yeah, much. Just, um, get all that information to council member Wong so she puts it on our website. Thank you so much for Thank you me. for being here. It says it on the card they can read. Okay. I, before we get into our next presentation, I just wanted to let the community know since there are many people that have not been to a meeting in person that we have public comment cards in the back. They're on the piano, they're blank. You can fill these out and submit them if you have a question, a concern, a comment about anything that's going on in Altadena. Um, I mention that now because I know that there will likely be questions regarding our next presentation regarding um, waste disposal in Altadena. So if you have a question that you already know you're going to need answered, you can fill that in and then you can just turn it in to anybody at the, at the end of the table. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, we move on to our next presentation. It's LA County Public Works, Altadena Sanitation Contract. Steve Malitsky. Malitsky. Okay. Thank you for having me. I don't have much. It's very short, so I won't keep taking much of your time. So my name is Steve Malesky. I work for LA County Public Works. And is the volume okay, or am I moving this? We're good? Bring it up a little. I, just, oh, I could go like that. Okay. All right. We're good? Can't see. So I just wanted to provide an update for the uh, trash services for your area. Uh, my team, and I brought Jose, Jesus Zerato with me, he oversees the day-to-day -day operations for your trash contracts uh, and on behalf of the county. And then I oversee all the residential trash collections as well. So for your community, I think I was here probably three years ago. It was me and my team that presented to let you know about that, that uh, current Athens contract was going to expire. And we thought we'd have it in place by then, but we're finally ready. We're the next one's ready to go. So we did an RFP process where we request proposals and we had four companies submit. Uh, there was Universal Waste Systems, Burtec Waste Industries, Athens Services, and Waste Management. And so an, an evaluation committee reviewed these and the highest rated was UWS, that's Universal Waste Systems. And they, had, they also had the lowest price at uh, $32.58, which I believe is the price you pay per month now. That's $97.74 per quarter. Uh, so the Board of Supervisors awarded the contract just recently on June 14th. And the service is set to start on October 3rd. So we got a little bit of time. Uh, during this transition process, you're probably going to have UWS, bless you, um, collecting from the Athens carts. You all have Athens carts at your homes right now. 
Uh, and so starting October 1st, or at the 3rd actually, because it's a Monday, you'll have a new provider, UWS. You'll see new trucks out there. And then they'll be in the process for about a month, swapping out the carts to their own. Um, what else we got? So UWS is going to be sending out information. They'll hold another public meeting similar to this, where they provide much more detailed information. This will be in September, because that's just a few weeks before the start of the contract. One of the big changes that's in the waste industry right now is the organic waste collection. What that means is basically food waste can no longer go to landfills. This is in response to Senate Bill 1383. This was a, a, a greenhouse gas reduction bill that was passed back in 2016 uh, and with the goal of slowing down climate change. So the polar bears, thank you. So that the big change for that is you're going to put your food into the green waste containers with the new contract. Uh, so what has changed? So the contracts come in two parts. We have the, what we call the county services. This is not necessarily what's happening at your house, but the services that we provide in the area. There's already illegal dumping collection for your community, uh, but that's on a, on a, it's a response. Um, we have to tell the waste hauler to go pick it up and, they, and they'll pick it up. The new contracts, we call it a sweep. Well, we don't have to tell the waste haulers, they're just gonna pick it up. Uh, so that should keep your community cleaner. Then we have added what we call hot zones. And so if there's a, I don't know, I, I brought a map and I can show you later in the back if you want, but there's probably five or six different hot zones in your area where it'll get, receive daily monitoring. So every single day the waste hauler will be in that area to remove the legal dumping. There is public receptacles. You already have public receptacles for the most part at bus stops and some pedestrian areas. But there might be the option then at a trailhead, I know Cheney Trail, and there's been talk over the years, um, sometimes somebody just pulls a trash container to an area from somebody's house and puts it at the trailhead. We might be able to provide an actual trash container for the trailheads. Uh, and pub, the um, people experiencing homelessness, this is a huge issue for many, many areas. I heard it mentioned earlier today. Uh, one of the services we're offering is to provide a dumpster at a large encampment to try to keep the neighborhood cleaner. Uh, there's mixed feelings on this because you're providing free services to the community, to the people who are living there, um, and you're somewhat enabling their, their lifestyle like that, but it's also keeping your community cleaner, so there's a trade-off on that. Uh, customer service, what's going to happen at your house? Everything that you have today, same things. I just highlighted a few things that are going to be more. So every, every service you have today, plus, at the same price. So the bulky item will change to four times per year if you have a bulky item. It's unlimited bulky items, five times a year ex excess trash, uh, five times, five bags of excess trash and, five, and ten bags of green waste. So four times a year you may call the waste hauler and schedule a collection for those things. Uh, wooden lumber, you can have two 70-pound bundles of that removed. E-waste, electronic waste, you can have 10 items removed. And then and also a, like a bonus bulky item when you start and cancel service. The idea is when you move in and move out, you'll get an extra bulky item. Now we can switch over to the bears. Let's just go ahead um, to the map because that's the, probably the most interesting thing. Um, so everybody that lives kind of to the northeast of that red line, will get mandatory, mandatory bear carts for free. Um, we're gonna start off by swapping out, it's gonna be the green. Remember, you're gonna start putting your food into the green waste container. So it's the black container should be clean, not well, clean as garbage can be, but um, it shouldn't be smelly like it is today. So the bear should be attracted to your green waste container. So that's gonna be the priority, is to convert all the existing bear containers over to the green waste to protect those. The new containers will have a gravity release to them. I know some of the ones that are out there today, Athens put them out and there's like, sometimes they have a clip or something you have to put on there. I don't know how many people still have those. But the new ones are gonna be the gravity release where when the truck comes and turns it upside down, it automatically empties out so you won't have to unlock it. Uh, what else do I wanna touch on? So if you have a bear container, you're gonna keep that bear container, except if you're one of the original bear container people. The original contract, there was 140 containers. I don't know how many of those are still alive because they're 10 years old now and they, that's about their useful life. So all the newer ones that have been distributed over the last couple of years, the county paid for those. Those are our containers. So Athens is gonna leave those in place and the new waste hauler will use those. So there's the testing. That's how the bears test. It's, it's funny because it, that's literally a picture from the testing for the bear carts. 
uh, they just put it in there as long as it can survive for an hour and the bear can't get inside, it passes. So that's it, that's, that's all I have. Um, any questions, I can either answer them right now. I, yes. Oh, council member, uh -huh. will, the, will the services that are in place for seniors, like rollout services, map over to the new provider? Or how will that be handled? That's our goal, we always try to do that. Like if, you're, if you were 62 or older, you were entitled to a senior citizen. It could be a discount for financial reasons or it could be um, inability to move the containers down the street. We would prefer to, try, you're obviously not 61 now. Nobody gets younger, unfortunately. So we're gonna try to roll that automatically over to the new waste teller. Sometimes there's some hiccups in the system, but that would be our goal is that you would not have to do anything on your part. And then if you're already paying for rollout services as an additional service, will that go over to We will try. Have, Sometimes, okay. it, there, I mean, depending on how many people have that service, that can get missed and they'll, you would have to maybe call. Like if you thought you were gonna get that service and you didn't get it picked up automatically like that, then you might have to call them and let them know. But we're gonna try to transition all that over automatically for you. What's the start I wouldn't know if I, enough on a compost bin, but the, it'll compost be. Compost in jails. Oh yeah, okay. It's uh, October 1st, which is actually the third, because that's the first Monday of the month. October 3rd. So don't put anything in there but green waste, traditional green waste, until that time. Just, uh, just a yes, quick sir. reminder, we do want to hear your questions, um, but we want to stick with the process. Um, if you can fill out a public comment card, we will get to them. Um, just uh, the questions right now are from the council. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. I'll pay attention. Yes. Um, I just have a quick question because uh, up here, lots of bigger, lots of bushes, lots of trees. Uh, containers tend to be a lot larger than the city containers in Pasadena. Is that going to remain the same, the size of the containers that we see in the green waste and regular waste? The or are they going to be going to like a standard city size? Because some homes up here, like we have two green waste because we have a lot of trees that your standard comes with. But is that going to remain the same, or are they going to go? Are the size of the container is going to be smaller. The size of the containers for most areas is pretty standard. It's a 96 gallon container. I'd say about this high, maybe two and a half feet wide. It's a pretty standard size. Uh, if you needed more, you could always get additional. But the, you get for the basic rate, you get one trash, one recycling, one green waste. If you need more, you can pay for more. You get a discount on the second one, but not the third. And you could, if you have a lot of green waste, then you could always get a dumpster. Green, green waste. Green. Yeah, I, th I thought you said e-waste. No, green. I'm sorry. Green waste. Sorry. If you had like a lot of green waste that you regularly trim your bushes or something, you could get a dumpster. Um, but if you only have it maybe a few times a year, then you can take advantage of our um, eight bags of excess green waste, and you can call it in up to four times per year. Any more questions? Just one. Okay. We take batteries or not? Batteries. Little uh, double A, triple A yeah, batteries. Yeah. That's always a problem. Batteries. Yeah. We, and we, so we t the idea e-waste is anything that's powered. Anything with a cord or with a battery is considered e-waste. But you know what? Yeah, the actual often they don't take batteries. Battery. So take them, yeah. I'll have to get I'll back to you on an actual out. battery. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. I'll get back. To okay, um, Council Member Wong, we're going to wrap the questions up. Yeah. Just uh, so some of our streets obviously are very narrow or tricky. So will the new company be able to handle some of that? Athens kind of has special trucks and, you know, that can kind of back in. And yeah, this, this company, UWS, they were previous to, well, they, they, had, they have contracts in the Malibu area and the mountains in Malibu. So I wouldn't say that that area is any simpler than your community up against the mountains here. It's pretty similar. So typically they'll use a smaller size truck. They're available. So they know what they're doing. And we'll have Jesus keeping an eye on them. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go. Thank you. And you'll be around for a public comment if we have questions. Okay, right? and I, I, I'm going to leave the map that you saw up on the screen. I'll, I have a copy back okay, here. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, thank you. Moving along, we're going to go to our community reports now. Nikki Winslow. Again, I know I'm seeing you guys all the time lately. Um, I think we take batteries, by the way. I just texted one of my staff, but I'm pretty sure you can drop off batteries at the library. Okay. 
Yeah. We dispose of them properly. We probably should have a box in here for batteries. Yeah, we should. Mm -hmm. I'll ask. Okay. So I guess I'll just start and then well, you can catch up to me with it. So good evening. Um, good to see all of you guys in person again, even though I've been running into a lot of you at events lately. Um, for uh, members of the community that haven't met me yet, my name's Nikki Winslow. I'm the district director for the Altadena Library District. Hi, Joan. Um, I'd also like to offer condolences to the council and the Barber family on behalf of the library. Um, and thank you, as usual, for providing me time to update everybody what's going on in our Altadena libraries. So I wanted to start out by talking about our Board of Trustees election that's coming up in November. Um, of our five seats, three of them are open this year. Um, they continue to be at large, so anybody can run for any of those seats. We're working on districting, but that wouldn't take effect till the election in 2024. Um, it's, a, it's a really short filing period, which is why I haven't talked about it much yet. Um, you'll be able to file to run for a seat between July 18th and August 12th at 5 p.m. So I'll, I'll mention it again next month when we present, but it's only like a couple weeks that you can file for one of those open seats. Um, so if you know of anyone that might be interested in serving on our Board of Trustees, uh, please point them to our website or in my direction and I can talk to them about it. Um, also, the board will be passing a resolution at their meeting next Monday uh, to put the special tax lien related to the Measure Z ballot measure passage that went through in 2020 um, on the tax roll for next year. Uh, it will appear on the October 2022 property bill. Uh, we did send out a mailer the week of April 25th um, to all Altadena property owners so they're aware of this tax that's coming up. There is an ability to file for a low income exemption. The deadline to do so is June 30th. So if you know of anyone um, that would qualify, uh, there's information on our website, altadenalibrary.org slash special tax lien, or send them my way. I've been talking about the special tax for almost two years now. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. But we wanna make sure people that are eligible for the exemption are aware of that. Um, you can pull the application from the website or we have printed copies at both of the libraries. Uh, just a quick reminder that both of the library buildings will be closed on Monday, July 4th in recognition of Independence Day. And we currently have a vacancy at our library, in our library aid position. This is an entry level 12 hour a week position. It's really good for like high school students or people looking for just some additional income. Uh, feel free to visit our website at altadenalibrary.org slash employment. Um, and we're gonna be reviewing applications I think uh, beginning next week. Um, so it's summer reading program time. Uh, this year the program runs from June 4th through July 30th. We have activities and programs for all ages, including um, for baby and toddlers. They have their own special program. They can read up to 24 books, not themselves, have them read to them. Uh, we also have uh, outdoor story times, some of them being held at Charles White Park, pajama story times, as well as bilingual toddler story times. We also have a, a program for pre-K through sixth grade. Um, they can track their minutes read, earn badges to complete the program and collect lots of fun prizes. Um, there's also a lot of really fun programs for them, including a magician that we're gonna have at the library this Thursday, the 23rd, Family Steam Club and lots more. Uh, for teens this summer, the emphasis is on a summer of service. So we have lots of opportunities for teens to volunteer, including a teen gardening program, uh, reading buddies, which is where the teenagers help uh, early readers uh, as they read to them, as well as serving on the Teen Leadership Council. Again, lots of fun programs and events. And then of course, we can't leave the adults out. Uh, we do have an adult program as well where you can track your minutes read and earn some fun prizes as well. Um, we're also having a community scavenger hunt out of the Bob Lucas branch in June and then out of the main library in July. So lots of fun. Um, we're also gonna have an upcoming murder mystery and other programs as well. So I know that's a lot. I did bring a plethora of handouts and flyers that are on um, the piano in the back, so please help yourselves to those. 
uh, because we have a lot of programs. And you can also visit the website. We have our events page that outlines all of that. Um, so let's see. We're excited to bring back all of these in-person programs, especially those that we get to partner with our community organizations. For example, we partnered with the Pride Committee to be the opening ceremony site um, for the first annual uh, Pride Walkabout, which was so much fun. Thank you, Nick. Um, and then this last Saturday, we partnered with the Historical Society to host a wonderful Juneteenth celebration. Um, thank you, Veronica, and everyone else uh, for including us in that planning as, as well. We're sponsoring, again, the Rotary uh, Summer Concert Series at Farnsworth Park, which kicks off July 9th. So hope to see all of you there. They're really fun. And then uh, just a really quick reminder that we have a community events calendar where anyone can add their program. So um, if you visit uh, our website, um, you can also, if you have news that you want to share, we do a newsletter called Altadena Connections. If you email us at news at library, altadenalibrary.org, we'll include that in future e-blasts as well. And you can sign up for those e-blasts. I highly encourage you to because it's information that's being sent to us from like lots of local groups as well. Again, thank you for your time. Sorry my presentation didn't show up. It's okay. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions from the council? Any? No? Whew. Would you be willing to um, speak to a neighborhood watch group regarding the tax? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Happy to go out and talk to anybody. But yeah, the, the deadline's June 30th, so... Uh, we would definitely want to talk to people soon, especially about the exemption. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're moving along here, and we have um, the Altadena Chamber of Commerce, Doug Cauliflower. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, first off, um, hopefully most of you are aware, but we had our, our annual installation and awards dinner on May 20th, honoring our Citizen of the Year, Deb Halberstadt, and our Business of the Year, Stacy uh, Whitney in the Altadena Farmers Market. We had a wonderful turnout, almost 150 people in attendance, and one of the ma major um, Goals for that evening is to raise money for the Marion Wolschlager Scholarship Fund. We raised a little over $8,000 this year, so we are, I think that's our all-time high and uh, delighted for the support of the community. And uh, those monies are targeted for uh, high school seniors in our community to help uh, uh, defray some of the, uh, the cost of higher education. So, um, wonderful evening, and those of you that missed this year, hopefully you won't make the same mistake next year. Um, secondly, we have a small, big, uh, small business mixer coming up on this Saturday um, by uh, Alan, Alan Peck's company. They're, it's going to be held at the library, I'm assuming in the community room, Nikki? Yeah. Um, from 2.30 to, oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, 2.30 to 4.30, is that correct? I'm sorry, thank you. And Alan's company, they make wonderful cookies, preserves, and, and lots of other tasty treats. So if you have some time, please stop in and visit that. It'd be a nice event. Um, and then I know Nikki just mentioned it, and I'm gonna slip my rotary hat on here for just a moment. And the summer concerts kick off just two weeks from Saturday at Farnsworth Park. Um, if you haven't ever been, you certainly should do so. It's free. Um, we have wonderful bands. I did leave some flyers back on the piano. Thanks, Reggie. Um, and you can also uh, get the information on uh, altadenarotary.org as well. And that's the extent of what I have, unless anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Doug. Okay, we now have neighbors building a better Altadena. Joan Reback. Thank you, Council, for your time, um, for giving me the time. Um, for those who don't know Neighbors Building a Better Altadena, 
we are refocusing ourselves since the pandemic on trying to um, facilitate and nurture an informed community. So all of those things that you aren't aware of, like when you have choices of what electric company part of your electric bill, do you want the sustainable people to be providing your electricity or your regular and what does it all mean and where does it all go? Or what are those things on our property taxes? What are all those different things that we pay for and where does all that money go and what comes back into our community? Anyway, we're trying to focus um, forums on all of these different kinds of things. We are starting though with the most important thing facing our community right now and that's water. We have a water symposium that we're organizing for Altadena on July 23rd. This is going to be stunning. Um, it's coming together better than we even imagined. So um, we, this will be three hours, nine to 12. Um, I love it that the town council and the library is here because they won't let us use this building because we're not the town council. So if you want to, you know, co-sponsor with us or something, or if the library wants to give us the space. Anyway, we're looking for the space, just saying. Um, and um, so it will be three parts. The first part is where does our water come from? So I've lived in Colorado. I've lived in Northern California. We all hated LA because they were taking all of our water. I moved to LA and nobody even knows where their water comes from. We hated it because LA because they were stealing our water, right? But now you guys don't even know, we don't even know. So anyway, where does our water come from? What's a watershed? Where, what are, um, how do our water companies get their water and where does it come from? Um, then it, what is the current situation with our water now and projected into the future and what can we do to adapt? Our speakers are Tim Brick, who is the managing director of the Arroyo Seco Foundation, an environmental group in Southern California. He's previously served on the board of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, an international leader in water conservation, and on the board of directors for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, where he served for 28 years. And Eileen Alduendo. Um, she was the watershed coordinator for the Arroyo Seco Foundation. She facilitated restoration education programs and projects. Her experience includes developing and managing community water conservation education and rainwater harvesting projects. I do believe she worked on planting a bunch of the trees that we have planted in Altadena. We have Tony Zampiello, who's executive officer for the Maine San Gabriel Basin Watermaster and Raymond Basin Management Board, and he oversees groundwater quality and supply management and directs functions associated with groundwater production, well construction, groundwater treatment, and resource planning. Um, we have a call in to, and I don't know if we're going to get him, but I'm going to say it anyway. At JPL, um, JT Rager is an earth scientist specializing in the topic of freshwater, and his research from satellites focuses on measuring changes in Earth's water cycle with a particular focus on hydraulic extremes, changing water resources, and implications for society. Um, we have somebody coming from the LA County Department of Public Works, Rubio Canyon Water District for our water companies, and then what can we do to adapt? So far we have Kathy Musial, who's curator of living collections for the Huntington Gardens for more than 35 years, has written publications. Oh, she's the Altatina Tree Warrior, um, not... Um, Eileen, and she teaches about where our water comes from, who uses it, and how to appropriate plant selections and good watering practices for home gardens. Um, and she also talks about island, heat island effects and carbon, capturing carbon from the atmosphere, et cetera. But um, we'll have some other landscaping people to really talk about what we can do ourselves. We're looking at maybe getting some water capture, gray water use, that kind of thing incorporated in that part. And my two minutes up. <laughs> I was talking fast. Two. Oh, yeah, you're five minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? Can you repeat the date again? July 23rd. 23rd. 9 to 12. 9 to 12. 
looking for location. Okay. That's and great. really, I hope you all will be there. We, we're getting these fabulous speakers, so we really want a good turnout. And get all of your constituents to come, please. Good it's information. Yeah, for sure. That's good information. Thank you, Joan. Okay, we're going to move on to our committee reports. We have Communication Committee, Nick Arzen. Thank you, Chair. Communication Committee is in our final stages of completing the new neighbor welcome packs. I'm very excited about these. Um, as a reminder, the packs are intended to warmly welcome folks moving into homes in Altadena. Um, the committee, the communication committee was formed to make sure that people in the community knew what was going on, similar to Joan's focus. Um, and we realized that maybe informing our youth and our new residents would kind of give us a good start to, uh, to doing that. Um, the PACs will provide valuable info to help the new people move, maneuver through town and settle into their new homes. The committee will also create a digital version for the AT website and discuss making those PACs available to current residents as well. Our next steps will be review of the intended contents by our committee, the executive committee and the council as a whole. So my fellow council members, you, if you're not on my committee, you will have a, a voice in this. Once that review process is complete, we hope to immediately begin assembling the packs and delivering them to new residents, hopefully as early as August. A similar pack is being created for new council members to welcome them and help them find the best way to communicate with and serve our residents. That pack is aimed for a completion date of September, just in time for any new members that might be seated in our fall elections. And as always, the communication committee will keep the full council informed and we'll move forward only after we have the majority of your approval. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Thank you. Um, we move on to um, Safe Streets. Council Member Wong. Uh, thank you, yes. So I'd love to give everybody an update um, in June. So May was bike month. So we did a, a lot of great um, advocacy to in empower youth by bicycle and just thinking about moving by bicycle. Uh, and then in June, time flies when you're having fun, it was 6-9, um, we did a follow up of the uh, Berkeley Safe Track uh, Community Pedestrian Bicyclist Safety Training and the follow up was to do a walk audit and sort of help our community learn uh, what it's like to actually walk around your community and sort of um, identify streets and you know different areas where you feel. And uh, we also learned about Street Story. So Street Story is a GIS mapping tool that then residents, people who live, work, and play in Altadena can um, just kind of give input uh, so that uh, it kind of creates a, a story of your environment. So that was uh, Train the Trainer we did on 6-9. Um, so if anybody wants to learn more or get involved, our next meeting is 6-30, uh, where we're gonna learn a little bit more about Metro's active transportation uh, plan. And um, uh, we're also gonna be evaluating a complete street assessment. So there was different studies done during COVID. Um, so that's, that was another study, so that's coming up in July. And then hopefully the goal with the uh, Mariposa market will be to feel uh, Mariposa between El Molino and Lake as sort of an expanded market where people can be encouraged to move by different modes uh, to the market. And um, so yeah, get involved, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving right along to education. Victoria Knapp, Council Member Knapp. I wanted to remind the community and my fellow council members that we've reestablished the Altadena Town Council Education Committee. I'm happy to report that Council Member Sylvia Vega will be joining the committee, even though she's not here tonight. We're looking for residents of Altadena. Angie, I remember reaching out to you, um, who, have or, who have or have had their children in Altadena public schools to join as well. 
Chair Jones and I met with PUSD Superintendent Brian McDonald to affirm Altadena's commitment to our public schools and to invite him to a future town council meeting. We also discussed partnership, uh, possible partnership opportunities. Um, I wanted to also invite the community to the Pasadena chapter of Integrated Schools Community Conversation, which is taking place this Saturday, June 24th, from 10 a.m. to noon at Perry's Joint on Lincoln. Anyone who's interested or invested in our public schools is invited to attend to learn about the history of our public schools and how school choice affects their future. There is an Eventbrite link to register, and both the flyer and the link will be on the ATC website. Thank you. Okay, we move on to land use, and um, the chair of land use, Diane Markison, is not here, but you will do her report. I will. The Land Use Committee uh, met on June 7th, and the committee heard a presentation on ADUs and the work being done by LA County on the West San Gabriel Valley Plan. More information can be found on YouTube by searching for Altadena Land Use Committee June 7th, 2022. And that's that for land use. Okay, moving on, we have, now we have our general public comment. Do we have public comment? We have one. Is that all the, we want to bring it up? You can all bring public. Them up to the end. Yeah. In person? Let's see. Do I get them or? Yeah. No, I do. Okay. Go ahead. You did. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Okay, so our first public comment comes from Charmaine Griffin. Homes on Metro on the last stop, please make the last, okay, so Loma Alta, you you're on Loma Alta. Oh, you yeah. get to come up. Because yeah, we don't have to read these. Come up, Charmaine, to the, are you still here? No, she, she, she just left, okay. okay. So she's basically, um, she's on Loma Alta Drive and she'd like the last stop of the bus route to be on Fair Oaks and Woodbury. Okay. She wants to reduce She wants to reduce it down. Okay. Is Glendar here? Glendar Haskin? No. Okay. Um, is, the, is there a community meeting Let's see, Loma Alta catalytic converter next event. Okay, can you read that? Yeah, that sounds. Yeah. I think we answered the question. CHP yeah. answered, or Sheriff Station answered when the next that you're working on the next, the date for the next catalytic yeah. converter and, etching event. And, and then, uh, Metro on the 6:30, we'll talk further about uh, active transportation. That's what that is. Is there a community meeting with Metro? Okay. Is Marilyn here? Please come up. And you've got two, so go ahead and you go ahead here. Good evening. So uh, I'm a resident. Oh, okay. <laughs> two minutes for each one. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, I'm on Grand Door between Harriet and Mariposa. I'm in Chris O'Malley's track. And the concern is uh, people who park their cars for long periods of time. Half of our street is private and half is not. And I'm on the private part, which is not so good as far as services. And um, so people who park their cars for long periods of time, and what is the protocol for working on that? You can you talk know? to the sheriff. The sheriff's department? Yeah. OK. So also. At the end of the street where Harriet and Grandeur cars are parked there also where it's difficult to see how you have to pull out to get onto Harriet and it's dangerous. So what's the protocol for? That goes to public works, that's a different. So. What will happen is we will give this to Chris and he will follow up with you on it. 
Okay, okay. My other concern is, um, not concern, but the pavement of streets in Altadena. I noticed some of the streets are starting to get paved and I know they hadn't been done in about 20 years. Um, and uh, our tract area is the poorest in Altadena. I did a map, I went into the county and did a map and it gave a color-coded map of ratings and our area is next to the bottom rating. The last rating is failed and ours is poor and it's the worst one in Altadena. So my concern is when are we scheduled to get our streets paid? So when you say poor, you're talking about poor streets. Poor quality. Quality of the streets. Like potholes, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, just all kind of cracks in the street and everything. Mm -hmm. So okay, and that, that will go to Chris and he can get back to you because that's, a, the county has a schedule. Yeah, that. so that's what I wanted to know. What and if you live on a private street, they don't. Have yeah, I, I, I know that. I know that, yeah. but my whole area looks terrible. Daryl? So when they, when they paved my neighborhood, I asked the guy, he says Altadena is in the system now. That is our timeline. They do it about every 15 years yeah, yeah. of when they repave it. So they're going along on their order that they have. So they are doing our neighborhoods now. It's, it's, it's in on schedule, don't yeah, know exactly I, yeah. when. I'm quite sure there is a schedule, but I'm yeah. just saying what I saw yeah. was it sh the schedule should be the poor streets first. And that's what my concern is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank, right, you. thank you. Thank you. If you have time afterward, I'd like to share some stuff with you too. You have to fill out a comment card, sure. Is Deborah still here? Oh, that's oh, okay. you. Okay, okay, go ahead. Come up. Yeah. My name is Deborah. Um, I've been an Altadena resident for over 30 years. I'm, the question I have, before I get my question, I just contacted um, Department of Public Works because I was concerned about the repayment as well that occurred between Moringo and Fair Oaks. There are no street reflectors and so forth. I've gotten in contact with them. That is supposed to be taken care of, and if they don't get back with me by Friday, then I will take it a step further. So um, there is going to be something done on that roadway. They did concur with the observation that I made, and so they will be doing something about that immediately. My question right now is the um, slow down safety signs, they're a wreck. Oh, yeah. they're, the poles are there, no signs. The signs are down. You need to either repair them or remove them. It's a blight on our community. And so I would like to know where we're at on that. Can I make just a quick comment? So one thing is obviously tracking of what's there, what's what's not being fixed or what, you know, all these. So the works app, LA County has the works app. So when I see them down um, or what, I, I will put it in there and they do respond. Okay. So you can write down, um, okay. it's public works and then it'll say, I think dangerous or you'll see unsafe conditions. Okay. And then you can put down slow streets. Good. And then uh, it'll GIS locate it and then and then they'll, they'll address it. Either it goes away uh, or it gets repaired. Great. Thank yeah. you, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we're going to, there, I think we have quite a few left, right? We have two. Two? Okay. Ella, did you want to make your public comment directly? Go ahead. Uh, it's just a quick question for Athens um, because I know you said that food waste, and I want to clarify, all food waste has to start going in the green waste container, right? And so I'm wondering, um, how would you communicate that to the Altadena community? Because I know habits are hard to change. And so if bears are targeting you know, um, cans with food in them, and we're making the switch for food to be in the green waste cans instead of the black trash cans, how will that be communicated? You can actually talk to him afterwards. Oh, and perfect. And right. just as an FYI, and even though we don't technically respond to these during the meeting, we've are, we have had um, uh, presentations about that in these meetings. Okay. So just so you know, there's, I think, a number of different ways that we're trying to get the word out to the uh, Altadena community. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Great. And is Dan still here? Yeah. I 
sign. Come on up down. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name's Dan Shapiro. I've been an Altadena resident for 22 years and uh, was a recent uh, recipient of the Sheriff's Department uh, citation for having a dog off leash up at Farnsworth Park at 7 o'clock in the morning. Me, along with uh, about 10 other uh, uh, members of the community. So since we were the only ones in the park, we were beginning to question whether or not this made sense, this policy of dogs off leash early in the morning uh, and citations resulting, whether or not it made sense. I began to do some research on it, found that in New York City, uh, dogs are permitted off leash in Central Park and virtually every other park in the city up until nine o'clock in the morning because typically the parks are not otherwise being used. So we've prepared a petition to have uh, Farnsworth Park uh, designated as a pilot project for altering the uh, uh, county code to uh, permit dogs off leash in certain designated areas of the park, Farnsworth Park to begin with, uh, up until nine o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday, and eight o'clock in the morning on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Reason being, the park is typically not used except the tennis courts and the um, what do they call it? What are they? Pickleball. Otherwise, the park is not used except by us. So that's, I have about 120 signatures on a petition. I'd like to present to the council uh, if you're ready to receive and or designate requests that we put on the agenda for an agenda item and consideration of our proposal. Okay. Um, what we'll do is your council person is is that you? I and, guess so, oh. yeah. So we're going to, you. yeah. We will turn it I'll over to them and they'll, right. they'll handle it. Do you want the petitions? Thank you. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks a lot. Okay, Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good. Good. Okay, we move on to our census track reports. 4601? Yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, update the community that um, there are several um, issues of concern that I've heard from residents about, and I wanted to let people know that I am following up on these. Um, the first is that a number of folks who hike the Altadena Crest Trail um, have been concerned regarding a potential zoning violation where a tall fence with, topped with razor wire um, at the top of East Glen Allen Court, um, leading into the Altadena Crest Trail. It's an easement for fire, but um, that zoning enforcement, I've submitted a request to LA County zoning enforcement. Um, I submitted that at the end of May, and um, I'm still waiting to hear about, they're going to go out and inspect and decide whether or not there is a zoning violation, but I wanted the community to know that this is in process. The second issue um, that's also been raised by folks in my census tract has to do with um, the Oroa Conservancy, which is upgrading the trail space off East Loma Alta across from the Rubio Canyon Dam. Um, I have been in contact with some members of the Conservancy, and what I'm trying to do is find a way to meet with them so that perhaps we can invite them to a town council meeting to make a presentation about how that upgrade and updating of the trail is going to proceed. Folks are a little bit nervous about um, construction noise, dust, um, and the impact on the local community. Um, so that is also in process, but I wanted to at least update folks so that they know that um, I have not forgotten about these issues. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we move on to adjournment, I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention Dr. Thomas, that Dr. Thomas is not here because she's ill, but she is recovering and getting better every day. So I wanted to mention her. Yeah. Okay. So um, the time is 8.35. Motion to adjourn. Second. And we're adjourning in the name of Madeline Barber. Thank you. Thank you Thank to you everyone. Time. Thank you. That's it. We're our first inaugural meeting in two and a half years.
All right, we got through it in how long? 